say thank you um, to Anne and Aki and to Ronald. Um, I feel embarrassed to say, to call them co-organizers because I feel like they did all the work, um, but it was, again, a privilege to, to, to work with them. Um, and to say thank you to, to Deborah Romero and Berta Delgado, particularly uh, for all of their efforts. Um, and also to you, the audience, and to the amazing panelists who've gone before, uh, but most warmly and importantly to, to Peggy herself. Um, uh, so our first panelist is uh, Jeffrey Bennington, who is Asa Jean Canberra Professor of Modern French, French Thought and Chair of the Department of Comparative Literature at Emory's University. And as, as you know, uh, one of the world's foremost scholars of the work of Jacques Derrida. He's the author, editor, and translator of over two dozen books um, and over 100 articles on deconstruction, critical theory, and continental philosophy. And I, I will name some of his books, but first I wanted to just uh, mention this beautiful 1979 article uh, from Narrative to Text, Love and Writing in Camion Fils du Flo and Bart. Uh, which I taught in the graduate seminar on the Enlightenment, and I think Mignon is here, um, was part of that seminar, and it just produced the most freewheeling, fabulous uh, discussion of Crédion that I, that I can even imagine. So I'm really grateful uh, for that particular piece. Um, his books include Sententiousness and the Novel in 1985, uh, Léotard, Writing the Events in 1988, uh, Du Vie des, des Noms de Rousseau in 1991. Uh, skip a few. Uh, interrupting Derrida in, in 2000. Uh, Not Half No End in 2010. And Géographie et Autre Lecture in 2011. And he's also the, a member of the French editorial team that is preparing Jacques Derrida's seminars for publication with Edition des Blés and the general editor with Peggy uh, for the English translation of those seminars. Um, with Chicago. His most recent book is Scatter One, The Politics of Politics and Foucault, Heidegger and Derrida. It's on democracy, sovereignty, teleology, teleology and political judgment. And it was published uh, by Foreman last year. Uh, and Scatter Two, The Matter with Democracy, uh, is forthcoming. So it's a great pleasure to um, welcome Jeff Bennington. Thank you. You're the second person I've met since 1979 who's read that article. <laughs> um, my talk is kind of about initials. I was going to talk about signatures, but I thought about keeping it short, so sometimes signatures, when they're made shorter, turn into initials, right? So I'm going to talk about initials. If I have a title, it's a sequence um, of initials. For some reason, I'm inclined to say it in French. It would go J J J D J B P K. I guess I could say it in English J J J D G B P K. Um, it's also about the initial, more generally, initial things, initializing, initial, initiating, as well as initialing in the sense of signing. By Jacques out of Jean-Jacques is maybe how it all started, what I'll call the initial moment. Peggy had written a really nice, characteristically over-generous review of my first book, in which JJ and JD both loom large. A little while before we met in person at the famous States of Theory conference at UC Irvine in the spring of 1987. Jacques was there and introduced us. I see us clearly, sitting outside in the spring sun sunshine, smoking cigarettes. That's something that people used to do back then. <laughs> Me, very timid, very intimidated, very jet-lagged, probably very serious and earnest, staring down, I remember, at the ill-tailored cuff of the new white pants that suddenly in California didn't look or feel as good as they had in England a day or two earlier. Peggy, insofar as I dared to look at her at all, a vision, blinding. <laughs> all this a kind of primal scene or primal screen memory for what I want to say today, 30 years later. 
In those 30 years since that day in 1987, how many conferences and other meetings, how many probable or improbable or even sometimes rather ridiculous places of intersection? Ones I remember most clearly, Cerisi for the Derrida conferences in 1992, 97, 2002, a memorable trio in 1995, first in Luton, England of all places, then in Louvain-la-Neuve, and then in Tuscaloosa, Lisbon and Arles in 1998, Stoke-on-Trent, almost as improbable as Luton, in 1999, Albany 2000, Coimbra 2003, London 2004, and then after the departure of Jacques, Georgetown 2005, Città di Castello 2006, Leeds 2007, Paris 2008, Jean Passe, and of course, 10 straight years of Derrida Seminar Translation Project workshops at the IMEC near Caen for a week at a time. As if over the years we moved beyond friendship and really became family. Perhaps a little in the sense in which that word is used in circles associated with organized crime. <laughs> Peggy, the big sister I never had, supportive, protective, but also, I like to think, an utterly reliable partner in crime. Although I didn't meet Peggy until that day in 1987, I'd met the name Peggy much earlier as a boy reading the Swallows and Amazons series novels by Arthur Ransom, Derrida tomes to prove one's reading prowess as a 10-year-old in England in the 1960s all wholesome outdoor adventures in which Peggy was, if I remember right, the younger sister of Nancy, both of them capable girls who knew how to make things and do things, how to fish and how to sail, how to handle a hatchet and a penknife, how to build a fire and survive in the woods, how to milk a goat, how to find north on a cloudy day, quite possibly how to kill and cook a rabbit or a chicken. To this day, I associate this Peggy with that Peggy so that although I now know that Peggy, this Peggy, was not in fact initially the farm girl from Ohio, she did indeed become for a while in the 1970s and 80s, as we were hearing this morning, in my thoughts and dreams, she still strides confidently through a world of daunting tasks and challenges, strong and hale, brisk and businesslike with those of us of a more timid or fragile disposition dismissive of any signs of sickness in herself, sympathetic to such signs in others, such as myself, but sympathetic in a way that always made me feel a little like a malingerer or a hypochondriac who didn't ever quite buck up, as they would say in those Arthur Ransom novels, <laughs> buck up and throw off the mild symptoms that would soon enough have me whinging or making excuses. One of the boys almost, Peggy, a brick, as they would say in Arthur Ransom. Peggy's always been a brick. At that memorable conference in Louvain-la-Neuve in 1995, to which I'd driven in stifling heat from Normandy, others had had all manner of adventures getting there from the quite differently memorable conference I mentioned in Luton, where I'd met, left them a few days earlier, and from which now distant place one I've never visited before and have never been back to since, from which now distant place I can still hear the mixed sounds of yobbishly gleeful violence, breaking glass and police sirens that I had had to explain to Peggy and Jack were the normal sounds of a provincial English town on a Saturday night in summer. At that memorable conference at Louvain-la-Neuve in 1995, there was a move for an Anglo night out in Leuven, for which I drove with Peggy, Jay Hillis Miller, Derek Attridge, and who else was it? David, maybe, but David, unusually for David, a bit of a blur in this memory, I have to say. Peggy in the middle seat in back, her cheerful face in my rearview mirror, one of the lads really making us all jolly. And this is the Peggy who's made it all happen for our annual seminar translation project workshops, organizing everything, dealing with all the details, keeping us all on our toes, keeping us all in order. That would be especially David and Elizabeth, if ever the temptations of rowdiness were to kick in. I was in the car behind 
on a dusk expedition to a beach in Normandy on July 15th, 1992, when having spent several hours that same day delivering Apori on his birthday at cerisy la salle Jacques Derrida driving the lead car in which Peggy was one of the passengers on a long right-hand bend in a country lane, and with what from behind seemed a kind of insouciant artistry one might aspire to emulate oneself, drove gracefully off the road and into a ditch, <laughs> leaving everyone shaken up, but a little miraculously, no one hurt. There's a group photograph of that 1995 Tuscaloosa conference. I never owned it, but I see it from time to time in my old friend Nick Royal's office at the University of Sussex. Alongside Jack and a couple of unrecognizably boyish Brits, and a completely unchanged and absolutely recognizable Rodolphe Gachet. <laughs> There's Peggy, looking stunning, glamorous, a movie star. Given the range and scope of what Peggy's written, it may seem a bit perverse that I don't really want to talk about Jacques Derrida here, and even that I don't really want to talk about translation although those are the two things that have most explicitly bound us together all these decades. Let's talk instead a bit about Jean-Jacques and see where that gets us. In her book, Signature Pieces, from around about the same time as that initial screen memory of 1987, expertly unpacking the complexities of Rousseau and what she calls the modern signature, and more especially exploring the obscurities of what Rousseau's social contract calls the sovereign, Peggy writes the following in the wake of Rousseau's demonstration that any supposed contract involved in slavery is meaningless, or as Rousseau puts it, ne signifie rien. She writes this, I'm quoting, if there is to be a coming together in a convention of meaning, I and you cannot be subsumed into only an I. By itself, in other words, I makes no sense. There is no meaning, no contract, without the more than one of an I-U articulated by their difference. As the inversion and negation of the social contract, the senseless convention of slavery is separated from the meaningful convention only so long as the sovereign never says I. And she immediately moves on to begin a new section with the remark, quoting again, Rousseau, on the other hand, both signs and says je. We are asking about the place of this particular signature in the general structure of non-signing sovereignty." End of quote. There follows a reading in which Peggy is always hyper-attentive to the beginnings and endings of texts, the way they open and close, reads the place of the je initially in the very opening of the contrat social, but with a view to showing up tensions between, let's say, a political theory in general on the one hand, and the singular autographical or autobiographical inscription of a signature on the other. The sovereign never says I, never signs, or even initials, the contract, and that non-signature in a sense opens up the very space of politics as such, insofar as politics proper is to be distinguished from what Camus just called glossing Rousseau, and quoting the senseless convention of slavery. It then becomes interesting End of quote. It then becomes interesting to track the instances of the pronoun I as it appears in the text of the Contrat Social, just because I seems to stand in a relation of some tension with the eyeless generality and perfection of the sovereign. A page earlier, she's quoted Rousseau's famous claim, I'm quoting, that the sovereign, by the simple fact that it is, is always ought that it ought to be. Toujours tout ce qui doit être. End of quote. At the time she was writing, of course, pulling up every instance of that first-person pronoun in the contrat social would have been a laborious task. In a footnote, Peggy mentions that the available concordance to the contrat social, I'm quoting, unfortunately does not index this pronoun, which falls into their category of utilitarian words. Peggy inserts an exclamation mark in brackets after that characterization in the quote, utilitarian words of one or two letters, end quote. And maybe, in fact, I was thinking it's a measure of what's happened 
in the time I've known Peggy that this type of remark would be unthinkable today when the very concept of a concordance is basically obsolete, when texts are or can rapidly become in electronic form their own concordance. I guess that's one not insignificant thing that's happened in these 30 years. Nowadays, of course, it's a trivial task for me to pull up an electronic text of the Contrat Social and with suitable care taken so that I don't count instances of the sequence J-E embedded in other words, jeté, rejeté, jeunesse, or cases that show up in the Contrat Social, even though on reflection that might in fact be quite an interesting exercise, especially it strikes me as I write this in the case of the word sujet, where the embedded je already refers to itself as it were, already signs itself as an I. But even if I reject those perhaps interesting embedded instances, I find exactly 101 examples, you can check if you like, of that little utilitarian word in what is, after all, a relatively short text of a broadly philosophical or theoretical character. Rousseau, as Peggy says, both signs and says je a lot. <laughs> I could actually spend quite a long time looking at the different classes within these 101 examples, not all of which I think would directly qualify as autobiographical or signatory in the way that Peggy's initial examples from the very beginning of the text seem to be. On closer inspection, there's a whole set of different and quite complex things happening with that little pronoun, ranging from the immediately self-referential examples Peggy is initially interested in. Je veux montrer, writes Rousseau proleptically at the beginning of his text, ranging from that kind of example through what I'd venture to call second-level performatives overlaying first-level constatives. J'avoue que, je dis que, including one example close to the one Peggy is in fact picking out, Rousseau declaring again a meaninglessness, but this time a meaninglessness of the supposed right of the strongest. He writes, Je dis qu'il n'en résulte qu'un galimacia inexplicable. S'il faut obéir par force, on n'a pas besoin d'obéir par devoir, et si l'on n'est plus forcé d'obéir, on n'y est plus obligé. On voit donc que ce mot de droit n'ajoute rien à la force, Il ne signifie ici rien du tout. And then on from those performative examples to uses of the so-called philosophical post-Cartesian je, where Rousseau is talking about a je in general, as it were. As, as it were, you should know, is one of my favorite translation solutions to a number of French idioms, especially the idiom en quelque sorte, and I've come to love the look of irritation and even disgust that comes over Peggy's face <laughs> at our EMEC workshops when I say it in that special way they have of saying it in Cambridge English, as it were. <laughs> uh, je, or an I in general, then a use of I not specially referring to Rousseau himself at all. So, for example, when he writes, Quand je marche vers un objet, il faut premièrement que j'y veuille aller. En second lieu que mes pieds m'y portent. He's not really talking about himself. Or another example. Dans l'état de nature où tout est commun, je ne dois rien à ceux à qui je n'ai rien promis et je ne reconnais pour être à autrui que ce qui m'est inutile. And from there on to still other cases of imagined interlocution that in fact include the example of the pseudo-contract of slavery that Peggy's been discussing. And then on again to still other kinds of case, such as anaphoric gestures to earlier or later arguments in the text. So there'd be a lot of work to do passing out the real and important differences between these kinds of classes of uses of the first person pronoun. Even if, as I believe is the case, they're all drawn towards the signature as Peggy is interested in it. But these 101 examples, it occurs to me a little while into staring at them and attempting this rudimentary classification, do not include the cases where the je contracts to simply the letter j in French, the je with an apostrophe before a vowel. And I really should have noticed those cases because the chapter in Peggy's book that I'm reading is after all called contracting the signature. 
Let me see. That adds 40 more examples to our initial 101. Examples, j'écris, j'espère, j'appelle, j'observe. One thing that makes through so special here is that this minimal j is not only a contraction of the pronoun je, and therefore at least sometimes a signature in the sense that Peggy's explicating, but it's also a contraction of another way in which Rousseau signs with his initials JJ, GG, a form that Peggy duly pursues in her book into some very bizarre textual places in Rousseau's corpus. Let's say that this minimal J is, at least in some of its occurrences, the smallest, the slightest contraction or the greatest contraction, I should say, of Rousseau's signature. In other words, his real initial. I'm going to suggest very briefly that this contracting signature trembles, and although Rousseau, uh, Peggy does not put it quite like this, this trembling of the signature is exactly what she's tracking in her readings. Now, Rousseau was ferociously attached to his signature, of course, and ferociously attacked because of it. He was one of very few French authors in the 18th century to publish his work openly as his own, rather than anonymously or pseudonymously and to insist on the fact, excuse me, and to insist on that fact or that act of signing as a vital component of his repeatedly declared commitment to the truth, indeed the devotion of his life to the truth, as evidenced in the Latin motto that his books bore above or below his name, vitam impendere vero, to risk one's life for the truth, to have one's life depend on, to stake one's life on the truth, perhaps. This staking one's life on the truth intrinsically involves taking responsibility for what one says and writes, involves signing, and as we say in contemporary American English, owning what one says and writes, declaring it as one's own. When I sign, I lay claim to something as really mine and even as part of me and take responsibility for it. And just this perhaps unprecedented insistence on Rousseau's part an insistence which itself is always beginning to escape the authority of the truth and open onto the realm of justice, which is perhaps one reason among many why there seems to be such an affinity between Jean-Jacques and Jacques, between J.J. and J.D., Rousseau and Derrida, even though Derrida's early readings of Rousseau are not really directly concerned with this question at all. Just this perhaps unprecedented insistence is an essential element of what led to Rousseau's books, as we were hearing earlier today, especially the Emile being banned and on occasion burnt, and he himself forced or encouraged into exile, whence he begins a relentless and already slightly crazy critique of the logic of literary authorship and responsibility that Peggy goes on to analyze in detail on the basis of a number of extraordinary and sometimes rather delirious texts including some where Rousseau signs a general disavowal of all his signatures, a kind of nothing signed by me really is by me declaration, which leaves the reader in a strict and uncomfortable undecidability that, as Peggy points out a little acidly, ought to have put harder questions to the editors of Rousseau's oeuvre complète than seems to have been the case in fact seems quite plausible to claim that all of Rousseau's subsequent trajectory, including the Confession and the other explicitly autobiographical texts, are driven and are driven mad by this discrepancy that opens up once a signature is performatively appended to any text making a truth claim by way of what I earlier called a second level performative, overlaying a first level constative. As Peggy puts it, I'm quoting, Having once engaged his word to speak only the truth that he feels, Rousseau will find himself constrained to multiply the acts of guaranteeing with another signature what he has already signed. Yet no single act of signing can ever sign for itself, and this leaves the door open to all sorts of improprieties and expropriations. End of quote. Let me add to the strange texts that Peggy reads an example that I don't believe she gives. Early in this process, assuming it's a process that can be at all narrativized, when Rousseau's fleeing for his life in 1762, 
and beginning a sequence of exiles in which he will, in spite of himself, more than once resort to subterfuge and pseudonyms. He recounts self-deprecatingly in a letter to Madame de Luxembourg, who we were hearing about this morning, an apparently genuine but failed attempt to give himself a false name and to sign for once with a false signature. He says this, he writes this, I must tell you that going through Dijon, I had to give my name. And having taken up the pen with the intention of substituting that of my mother, I could not go through with it. My hand was trembling so much that I was twice obliged to set down the pen. In the end, the name Rousseau was the only one I was able to write. And the whole falsification consisted in leaving off the J of one of my two forenames, end of quote. Now, I assume that Rousseau is not saying that in leaving off one of his J's, he wrote his name as Jean-Jacques or Jean-Acques, but rather that in his best effort at falsification, he managed only to change J.J. Rousseau, Gigi Rousseau to J. Rousseau in such a way that we do not know if the remaining J is the J of Jean or of Jacques. For obvious reasons, I prefer to think it's the latter, and that what I just now called the minimal trace of the signature, the, as it were, generic J as an initial contraction of Je, can on that basis always be read everywhere in Rousseau as the parallel contraction to the initial of a proper name so significant to both of us the trace of a trembling hand will ever have to be struggling to read, and one into which, by a bilingual trick, transforming J in French to J in English and then back to J in French, I imagine also, such is the drive to sign and such are the ruses of narcissism, I imagine also smuggling my own first initial G. I won't have the time here to argue the point as it deserves to be argued, but I'd like to suggest in conclusion that this moment of the signature of, of the initial, the minimal autobiographical inscription that seems in the case of the Contrat Social to be precisely as Peggy claims what the sovereign must not indulge in if we're to have a meaningful political contract rather than a meaningless pseudo-contract of slavery, for example, is in fact exactly what the sovereign does in quasi-transcendental fact and cannot avoid doing if that meaningful political contract is actually to be political. And therefore, I want to say, not entirely or exhaustively meaningful after all. All is well, so long as the sovereign does not say I, perhaps. But it's part of the logic of sovereignty that the sovereign's not saying I will lead to supplementary agencies or instances having to say I in its place most famously, the legislator, on which figure it feels like I spent valuable years of my life. But also, I want to say in the context of the social contract, government as such, what Rousseau sometimes calls the prince, the executive, which fills in for the sovereign's intrinsic lacks and thereby gives it a chance of being sovereign, but which thereby ends up inevitably usurping the sovereignty it was supposed to serve. I want to say that just that space opened up between sovereign and supplements is politics in the very broadest sense. That it bequeaths to us the chance and the curse, not just of politics in the narrow sense, but of a much more general scene of negotiation I want to follow Peggy and call reading. See, Jacques, I wasn't joking. If the sovereign were sovereign, we would have nothing to read. The very fact that the text du contrat social is here for us to read is proof already that the sovereign is not sovereign. I want to call it reading that practice of reading so exemplarily, curiously, and patiently pursued all her life by Peggy Cameron. I confess I hadn't really taken the full measure until rereading her for this event today, how important Peggy's work has been from the start to my own ability such as it is to dwell in these zones from these early, for me, initial analyses of Rousseau and his trembling signature. That chance and curse of reading to which we're exposed and condemned is made possible by the initial trembling of the signature. But in return, it's only reading as counter-signature 
that allows that signature and always only relative stability, so that at the very end of signature pieces, in one of those liminal places in a text to which she pays such close attention, concluding a dense reflection on the intersections between the generality of the text and the singularity of reading, Peggy writes, still speaking to me today, across 30 years, I quote, and this is to say not only that readers too must sign, but that my signature, any signature, takes place as an effect of reading. Initial that. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Ruckenberg, who is Associate Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Philosophy and Director of Comparative Literature at DePaul University. Uh, Professor Rottenberg's teaching and research span the fields of philosophy and comparative literature and includes contemporary French philosophy and psychoanalytic theory. She's the author of Inheriting the Future, Legacies of Kant, Freud, and Flaubert, Stanford, and the forthcoming For the Love of Psychoanalysis. Um, and she's one of the six founding members of the Derrida Syndicate's translation project. Her work also includes uh, translations of Jean-François Lyotard's Lessons on the Analytic of the Sublime, uh, Maurice Blanchot's Friendship, uh, Maurice Blanchot's and Jacques Derrida's The Instant of My Death and Demeure, Jacques Derrida's The Death Penalty II, um, and she's the editor and translator of Negotiations, Interventions, and Interviews um, by Jacques Derrida, as well as the co-editor, translator, with him uh, of the two-volume edition of Jacques Derrida's Psyche, Invention and Geography from Stanford. Um, in addition to, to all of this, Work. She's published many articles on themes in late modern and contemporary philosophy in journals including the Modern Language Notes, Philosophy Today, the Journal of Speculative Philosophy and Theory at Buffalo, and the Oxford Literary Review. And she's also uh, practicing uh, psychoanalyst in Chicago. Please uh, join me in welcoming Elizabeth Rutman. Thank you. Is this on? Not that I'll need it, but <laughs> I'd like to begin or end now by thanking once again our organizers, Aaron, Aki, uh, Natanya, and Ronald. My title, Congratulating My Roomie on Her Retirement. <laughs> there, I've done it. I've used the R word in public. It's in my title now, so you know. But I imagine you already knew Ronald is here, isn't he? Is there anyone who didn't know that Peggy and I were roomies? Anyone who didn't know that we have been sharing a room for 10 years every summer for six days at the archive and research facility known as EMEC? Not to worry, though. I won't say anything salacious or turn these remarks into the Derrida dossier. We are here at an academic conference, and I wouldn't want to cross that line, especially not at USC. USC is hardly the place for a scandal. <laughs> that one got a laugh. <laughs> or maybe I'll tell just one story. It's a very chaste story since it's the story of Peggy not propositioning me. In the summer of 2014, which was the summer we worked on Jeff's translation of Derrida's 1964-65 Heidegger, The Question of Being and History, there was a misunderstanding that resulted in there being too few rooms available at EMEC to accommodate all the participants of the Derrida Seminars Translation Project, AKA Dust Up. And yes, David did choose the name for its acronym. As a result, Dust Up was two rooms short. This meant that Peggy, our leader and convener, was forced to make an executive decision. She and I, and Michael Nass and Pascal Androu, would rent two rooms at a nearby hotel in Caen. It was not a particularly nice hotel, but it was an easy walk 
from the Abbaye d'Ardenne, where the research archive was located. In our room, there was a TV suspended in the far corner of the ceiling and two twin beds propped up against each other. So close, in fact, that at first, we thought they were a single queen-size bed. Don't get any ideas, Peggy said, as she tried to separate the two beds. <laughs> Don't flatter yourself, I said. <laughs> that was the same summer that David asked how things might have been different if what we call deconstruction had instead been called as Derrida does in the 64-65 Heidegger course, solicitation, solicitation. In my fantasy, however, it is two summers later, and I am able to take Peggy down a peg or two, but nicely, politely, by quoting the idiom with which Derrida begins his 76-77 seminar, Théorie Pratique. For fuck, I hear myself saying, in response to Peggy's unsolicited comment. That takes the cake. I will have much more to say about my roomie, but first let me mention the other, perhaps less titillating, R word in my title, retirement. In a 1999 article for the New York Times titled, The History of Retirement from Early Modern Man to AARP, Mary Lou Weissman uses this expression, the R word, to describe the final chapter of what turns out to be the very modern history of retirement. Modern because it was not until 1883 that Otto von Bismarck announced that all, all non-working Germans over age 65 would receive a government pension. And it was not until 1935 in the United States in the wake of the Townsend Plan, which called for every person over 60 to be paid $200 a month by the government, that Franklin D. Roosevelt passed the Social Security Act, whereby workers began paying for their own retirement. In the beginning then, writes Weissman, ironizing her own attempt at historicization, quote, there was no retirement in the Stone Age Everyone was fully employed until age 20, by which time nearly everyone was dead, usually of unnatural causes. <laughs> and yet, as it turns out, late 20th century, America has something of the Stone Age about it. And I'm not referring to Trump or the Republican Party. Once again, it would seem, but for different reasons, higher rather than lower life expectancy, we are back in an age of no retirement, or at least no retirement age. For what the R word refers to in the end, and you will be disappointed, is not a prohibition. Rather, what the R word designates is the literal disappearance of a superannuated word. In fact, as you will discover if you look online, the organization originally called the American Association for, of Retired Persons officially changed its name in 1999 to AARP, which would be short for nothing, no longer an acronym, pronounced as I have just pronounced it, following the pronunciation guide on the website, quote, one letter at a time. And the website actually transliterates these letters. So A, A Y, A, A Y, R, A, R, P, P, E, E. <laughs> <laughs> As it turns out, the word retired was itself retired from the official AARP name, and this for a very simple reason. Many of its members were not retired. Weissman explains that it was both in recognition of this fact and in anticipation of the, quote, baby boomers' threat never to stop wearing lycra turn gray, stop carrying around bottled water, or retire, that the AARP changed its name and its requirements for membership. Members no longer had to be retired. They only had to be 50 years old. Indeed, as the AARP made this transition from the welcome wagon of retirement to the 70 is the new 50 club, 
It even began offering, and I don't know if my use of this idiom is ageist or reverse ageist, it even began offering an early bird special. <laughs> Quote, an AARP membership includes free membership for a spouse or partner who may not yet be 50. Now, I don't know if Peggy is a member of the AARP, but I do know, one, that she's over 50, and two, that she has retired. And if I put retired in quotation marks, it is because when you hear how much she has done since her retirement, and I will remind you that the dictionary definition of retirement is, quote, the action or fact of leaving one's job and ceasing to work, you will feel that it is you and not Peggy who should be retiring. <laughs> you might even include that retirement a la Peggy is no retirement at all, or that Peggy's retirement causes the line between labor and leisure, work and rest, activity and inactivity, hetero employment, self-employment to shake and tremble. The last seven months, for example, have seen not a cessation of work, but an acceleration of work in the form of both work work and leg work. Since her so-called retirement in May 2017, Peggy has lectured in Paris, London, New York, Ithaca, Chicago, and Memphis. That's six lectures in seven months, one lecture every 1.17 months. I'm going to skip this year's publication since I, I don't know the exact month in which they were published, and my aim here is to be precise. I will jump instead to Les Livres à Venir, the books to come in Peggy's immediate post-retirement years. 2018 will, as many of you already know, see the publication of her new book, Literature and the Remains of the Death Penalty, with its beautiful Italian clock tower cover, a book that will be published by Fordham University Press. And if I mention the name of the press here, it is because of an interesting and rather implausible fact, one that I discovered just recently. I will recall it here, but I will not interpret it. Peggy's six books will have been published at six different presses. Nebraska, Cornell, the University of Chicago, Stanford, Edinburgh, and now Fordham. As I said, I will not interpret. I will not say much about the translation of Hélène Sixou's Omer et Mort, except to say that it will be published at Edinburgh University Press, but I will hype Peggy's French editorial debut, a debut that, it goes without saying, is split and double, irretrievably divided, as Peggy might say, with Pascal Andrew, Peggy is editing both Derrida's 1975-76 seminar, La Vie, La Mort, and his 1995-96 seminar, Hospitalité. Let me stop here, because I think I have made my point, namely, that Peggy seems to have mistaken the tire in retirement for a wheel that keeps on turning. <laughs> Full fur. It takes some doing. Which brings me back to what David, in the summer of 2014, called the pass activity of solicitation. Indeed, much like solicitation or deconstruction, Peggy's retirement allows us to think, and I'm quoting Peggy here, quote, beyond the pertinence of the opposition of activity to passivity neither active nor passive, but rather past, active. Retirement, in Peggy's case, is a kind of inaction in action. I hope, you've under you have, I hope you have understood me. I've tried to enunciate these three words very clearly. Although my first impulse was to write inaction with a hyphen in order to make use of the hyphen's double sense of articulation, which both joins what it separates and separates what it joins, I quickly realized that you might mistake the hyphenated phrase in action for the noun in action, i.e. for the very thing that Peggy's retirement puts into question. Now I know it's a stretch, but I would like to take this opportunity to return to a very personal self-analytic moment in Peggy's work. I do so not only because it involves a mishearing of a hyphen, and I had no idea what David was going to say this morning, hence my association, but also because it serves as a cautionary tale of what to watch out for 
when, being, when giving Peggy a gift, say, a retirement gift. Peggy begins the 15th and final chapter of her book, Book of Addresses. This is the book that is published at Stanford with what she calls the episode of the second hand. And there is a hyphen in parentheses between the word second and hand for reasons you will understand in a moment. Now, David mentioned the latter part of this episode and where the chapter goes on. He didn't mention the actual uh, exchange that I'm going to talk about now. This episode, you may recall, begins as a coming-of-age story involving a gift. Quote, it was the first grown-up gift her parents had given her. The gift is a watch set, a small gold-colored watch with an assortment of differently colored interchangeable wristbands. The whole set, writes the narrator, quote, was presented in a long white jeweler's box that sprang smartly open and shut. It is a jeweler's box, but also, it turns out, a Pandora's box that gives rise to a poisonous exchange between mother and daughter. Quote, it has a second hand, said her mother, after the girl had had time to give the first signs of gratified pleasure. As these did not give any indication that she had noticed the special feature, her attention was being drawn to it. Oh, I don't care about that, she replied. <laughs> Shocked by her daughter's bold face in gratitude, the older woman's face de decomposed. The dismay almost choked off her voice. What a thing to say. In a flash, the whole scene came crashing down around the girl's ears, the very ears that had somehow tricked her into reading lines from the wrong script. It's secondhand, said her mother. Oh, I don't care about that, was the girl's reply. The girl's words meant only to reassure her mother about the value of the secondhand gift end up doing irreparable damage. Quote, the mother looked at her daughter now with mistrust, making no attempt to dispel the sense of the latter's trespass. For the words of the daughter have added insult to injury. Not only has she insinuated that her parents may have been too cheap to buy a new watch for their only daughter, but she has also responded to her, other, her mother's extra measure of affection. Here, look, not just one hand, but two, a second hand for my daughter, who is second to none, with indifference. Oh, I don't care about that. But the girl does not hear it has a second hand. That is, she does not hear that the open compound second hand refers to the hand on a watch or clock that ticks off the seconds. Rather, what she hears is a line from another script, the wrong script, in which her mother uses the hyphenated adjective second hand to refer to a used or pre-owned object. Look, it's only second hand. Oh, that's okay, I don't care about that. I won't have time to go through the many steps of the narrator's brilliant uh, analysis of this malentendu. Suffice it to say that neither mother nor daughter escapes unscathed from this analysis. The episode ends by returning to the daughter's strange mishearing, verhören. And though Freud's word for the parapraxis in question is never mentioned, the narrator recognizes that for the girl to have heard its second hand, quote, she had to have wished to overlook the obvious, the brand newness of the thing that came wrapped in the absence of a past and that could change its appearance in order to efface whatever traces of wear it would inevitably accumulate, close quote. In other words, the girl's past active desire for past for a different past, for a different mother, remains. As does a very singular articulation of what Peggy calls the general structures of meaning. Having just recounted the episode and its sequela, the narrator, who is Peggy, as we discover, remarks, 
quote, an elementary lesson in the vicissitudes of speech in which saying and meaning could be dissociated quite ruthlessly without apparently the least intention on the speaker's part. My meaning is not mine, so long as it depends on hearing and therefore on others." Close quote. What I will suggest here is that in the use of the adverb ruthlessly to describe the exchange between mother and daughter, we get, quote, a sense of the singular. For the girl's mother, that is to say Peggy's mother, happens to be Ruth. That is, the experience in which saying and meaning are ruthlessly dissociated, the experience of being ruthlessly dispossessed of one's mother tongue, is singularly, in this case, the experience of Ruth. So you see why I said it was a cautionary tale. One would not want to be on the receiving end of giving Peggy, say, a watch for her retirement, a gift that holds a mother load of resentment. <laughs> The problem is that watches make good gifts, and they make especially good retirement gifts. Even the most cursory online search shows the watch to be a classic or traditional retirement gift. Quote, a classic retirement gift is a watch, necklace, plaque, inscribed with the years of service to the company. You might also consider including any noteworthy work achievements. This is from the US News and World Report, May 11, 2017. Or, as we read in the AARP's newsletter of May 16, 2017, although traditional gifts, such as a watch or an engraved plaque, are a safe choice, a more personalized present that reflects the individual's personality could be more memorable in the long run. Fortunately, I was not the designated gift giver, and it is my hope that the person who was is not having second thoughts at this very moment. But I'm not going to dwell on the past. Instead, I'm going to bring the two terms of my title together, Rumi and retirement, in the hope of transforming a malentendu into an entente. To do so, I will turn to another meaning of the word retirement. As we know from several entries in the OED, retirement also means seclusion. It signifies both, quote, the state or condition of living apart from society, seclusion, privacy, and, quote, the action or an act of retreating into seclusion, quiet or privacy. In fact, in both American and British English, one finds many examples of this colloquial, colloquial use of the term. It is also used in a related but more archaic way, as you will hear in a moment. Thus, in the New Oxford American Dictionary, we find, quote, he lived in retirement in Miami. And somewhat more archaically, quote, Vermont, where he has a sweet country retirement. And it's more or less the same thing in British English. We find the very same example in the Oxford Dictionary, or rather, we find the same example with a twist. That is, as it were, with some English put on it. <laughs> Quote, he lived in retirement in Kent, and again, somewhat more archaically. Quote, Exmouth, where he has a sweet country retirement. <laughs> Now, I'm going to suggest that here, too, Peggy challenges the possibility of living in retirement. In her work, of course, she has shown us that even the experience of interiority, of which retirement as seclusion would be but an exteriorized expression, depends on a, re on a relation to, quote, some exterior non-selfness. That is, it depends on a relation that won't let us just chillax, but that remains, if anything, troubling and insistent. Whether Peggy points, as she does in Fictions of Feminine Desire, this is the book that is published at Nebraska, to, quote, that troubling notion of a between the sexes, a place where the phallocentric privilege flounders, the persistence of a difference within a phallic ordering of the same, or whether she speaks as she does in signature pieces, this is the book that is published at Cornell, <laughs> of the, quote, 
traces of an otherness that insists in the very place of identity signature. It is clear, as we read in To Follow, this is the book published at Edinburgh, that, quote, giving, dif giving difference its due has fundamental consequences for how we represent and describe so as to account for the experience of interiority as a space of relation to some non-self, alterity, some other, indeed, more than one other, close quote. So what I want to suggest is that Peggy, Peggy's retirement challenges the possibility of seclusion, not only in general, in principle, but also in fact, that is, in a very specific and localized way. I should say that when Peggy first told me in 2015, 2016, that she was thinking of retiring, she was very clear that she did not want to be, and these are her words, put out to pasture. Just to be clear then, before I let the cat out of the bag, the other in question is not a horse. Rather, Peggy's retirement <laughs> forces, forces us to think beyond the fictions of feminine desire to something more enigmatic and strange, namely the fictions of feline desire. That is, it forces us to think, and I am re-quoting Peggy here with a few minor modifications, quote, that troubling notion of a between the species, a place where the anthropocentric privilege flounders, the persistence of a difference within a human ordering of the same. Indeed, as we read in a very recent post-retirement email in which she discusses two kittens who have become her BFFs, her best feline friends, quote, Leander is still behind the washing machine and Psyche is upset because her brother is missing. We might even speak of a, quote, self-relation that is possible as an effect only through differing from and deferring of some exterior non-selfness. Quote, I flushed Leander out without any violence, but now he's hiding somewhere else. I think I'm too old for kittens. In other words, Peggy knew how to make the leap toward the impossible by exposing herself with the gracious gift of an almost unconditional hospitality, what's a little flushing, to the arrival of more than one other. In, indeed, these new BFFs may tire Peggy out time and time again, and in this sense, retire her with a hyphen. But such a retirement, Peggy's retirement, will not fall back on metaphysical oppositions or distinctions, rest, unrest, etc. In the end, though, it is with Peggy's post-retirement signature that I would like to conclude my remarks. Before I do so, however, I will remind you what Peggy says about the signature in signature pieces. Quote, is not the signature the first and thus the strangest mark of my estrangement from myself, so near and yet so far? My signature is a reminder not only of the limits on my strength or my outlook, but of the finitude that is me. Close quote. And here I will quote an email sent to me on, on Saturday, November 4th, 2017 at 12.33 p.m., in which Peggy offers a vivid description of her retired state or condition. Though her email begins by invoking a we, which it then divides into its constituent parts, I and they, it is to her signature, a signature, signature, one might say, that I would like to call your attention. Quote, we continue to make progress. Today, for the first time, I held Leander for a few minutes in my lap, Psyche is still not ready for that, although in many ways she is more adjusted than he is. They eat treats out of my hand and love to be petted, just not held. But I have hopes. Love, your cat lady. <laughs> now the point is not to decide whether or not Peggy is a furry, or whether a cat lady must live in a cat house if deconstruction is solicitation. No, the point is to register the otherness that insists in the very place of Peggy's signature, for it is clear that Peggy remains and will remain for some time under the watchful eye of Psyche and Leander. But like Peggy, I have hopes, hopes that these new roomies will share, if not a bed, at least a sweet retirement with Peggy. Thank you.
everyone takes back the beautiful engraved watch that we have. <laughs> Talk about those ones. <laughs> I actually wrote down ruthlessly, and, and then you went on to draw it out. Yeah. Um, no, I have to admit that it was listening to the two of you that had me most trembling <laughs> today in anticipation um, for I didn't know what. <laughs> <laughs> and um, as, as Jeff has, has explained, as others did, it's coming on, I, I hope not the tail end of a long friendship, but um, um, there were surprises. Um, again, Jeff described a first meeting, which I do remember. <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. Well, no. Him, I mean, him. It was later. No, it was it was earlier. But um, <laughs> but what? But I don't remember the scene of sitting in the sun and um, being blinding. <laughs> Certainly not. But whether whether I doubt it was there because we did just meet. But it was. <clears throat> Sometime not long after that, after Signature Pieces was published, and the fact that you referred to this book really did have me trembling. Um, I mean, I'm sitting next to a great Rousseau specialist and across from another one, and I was always a bit of a dabbler in Rousseau. Um, as you pointed out to me, actually, once, <laughs> Jeff, not that I was a dabbler, but I, I, it must have been in that book that it, in a kind of throwaway moment in a footnote, um, I had said something like one of the people to whom Rousseau had confided a copy of the dialogues was Boswell, which I don't think I made that up, but I must have read it somewhere, but you pointed out to me that it you know, I had mistaken Boswell for somebody else, and it was all very embarrassing. Terrible error. Terrible. Like it's really, I'm surprised you can live with yourself having made such a... And repeat it. Well, it's been me. hard, yeah, <laughs> especially in your proximity. <laughs> oh, Booth C? Brooke Booth B. Brooke Booth B, right? B, B? Yeah. Yes, well put me to shame. Um, and um, on the R word, <laughs> I can't believe you were so indiscreet. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> it's true that for many years now, ever since we started, I have to explain that we're forced to <laughs> share words. <laughs> This is, I mean, Jeff and Dave, and nobody. I remember once when they were carrying on, saying to them, "Why don't you guys get a room?" <laughs> and they said, "We do have a room," <laughs> and we're forced to share it. Um, so, I mean, it's true that we, everyone has to share rooms, and nobody particularly likes that, but that's the circumstances. Um, so, for ever since then, for 10 years then, Elizabeth and I have called each other roomy. It's true. But you started it. I <laughs> um, Yeah. Well, I think I'll stop. <laughs> we have about 10 minutes or so for other remarks or questions. It's a hard thing. An interesting point. This is serious. <laughs> when Bismarck introduced the time, the, uh, the average life expectancy, I believe, it's in the like, mid 40s. So it was this grand social. Well, but no, not so no, grand. No, 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 nobody was going to live that time. Okay, I'll just add. 
um, you just talked, uh, you, you just, no, it was Karen who talked about Monte Carlo and um, which I assume, oops, Karen, where did you go? <laughs> we lost Karen. Um, which I learned about anyway through this financial advisor whom we share. And what Karen forgot to mention is the one variable that is the really key variable that you plug into these, this algorithm is when you're going to die, right? You have to choose an age. I mean, otherwise, it, the, whole, the whole thing just is derailed. Um, so it's a very interesting moment in, in which Charlie, that's his name, the financial advisor, um, kind of you know, looked at me and said, well, how old were your parents? <laughs> and that's kind of what you go on, right? So I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for those really engaging um, talks. Um, which which um, both brought up um, the question of divide for me and Professor Kevin Kinsler from Helen Dubois. And um, Professor Rockman, I really appreciate you talking about um, kind of drawing that out and talking about gender difference and the stories of mothers and daughters and um, or maybe even species difference. And I was wondering if someone wanted to, or maybe Peggy herself wanted to talk a little bit about her investment and her career in feminism. It meant in a very um, avant-garde sense. Um, although, I think today has also been partly a testament um, in terms of uh, her, her work and dedication to the university as um, what it is to be a woman in academia. Um, so I don't know if anyone has thoughts about that. Or even <laughs> the question of um, where the intersections of deconstruction and feminism in that way too. No, that's, a, that's for Peggy. Yeah. yeah, Kendra, thanks for that. Um, um, I've heard the, the title of my first book, which was not my dissertation, actually. Um, I never published my dissertation, which was on Rousseau and women. Um, dabbling. Dabbling. <laughs> no, no, dabbling. <laughs> um, but Fictions of Feminine Desire, which was not my first choice of title, it was the publisher. That was Nebraska. Thanks, Elizabeth, <laughs> for pointing that out. But yes, I don't know. I always kind of change publishers. Um, and that was a time when um, it was really exciting to be working in, um, not that it isn't still, but it felt like breaking ground, um, particularly in French studies, perhaps. I recently wrote an essay on, that was kind of not on, but sort of, um, um, in the direction of Naomi Shore. Naomi Shore, um, who was uh, a, a 19th century French scholar uh, who died um, too young. And, um, Mayo and realizing that Naomi and I, we were kind of, she was a little bit older, but it was a time when she and I and Nancy Miller who was also then more in French studies, felt kind of like we were on a frontier in, in that field. Not that we were alone, there were many others, but, and then there, um, and Ronald can, can uh, corroborate this testimony that part of um, the way I spent my last semester on leave um, uh, final research semester, it's called, was actually going through all my files and um, 
sending most of the papers to the feminist theory archive at Brown University, which had been, which is where Naomi Shore taught for many years, and actually that archive was founded to house Naomi's papers, first of all. But since then, there are dozens and dozens of mostly American, but not only American women academics um, whose papers are archived there. And they had asked me they, from the beginning to, to commit to giving them my archive. And I mean, I always was, I was never against the idea, but it was just the actual doing of it that was daunting. And this is what Ronald can testify to, because speaking of slavery, <laughs> I enslaved him for, for I don't know, quite a few, several weeks. To um, go through all of these things and, and winnow, I called it the purge. I managed to save a lot from the church, I have to say. <laughs> like, for instances. Well, yeah, no, we filled, yeah. we filled several dumpsters, but um, a lot of it did go off to, to Brown, and it's now searchable. And there, I mean, it's not all feminist work, because it's true that, that you know, things took other directions. But, um, I mean, deconstruction, you asked about deconstruction and feminism, and, and that intersection, that conjunction, was, was always the kind of motivating um, space for, for my own thinking, and a lot of other people, including Naomi, um, uh, that um, I don't feel I've, so much gotten away from, but it's it is less foregrounded. I confess. Lately, <laughs> well, I'd like to not so much cut the conversation short as move it to a, another menu with more wine. Um, and I want to uh, invite everybody who's here to the University Club for a reception with champagne and some sweets and good conversation with friends. And um, but a big round of applause for our panelists.